Bacon is Shakespeare, Francis Bacon and the Jaggard Connection. This video is dedicated and indebted to the many Baconian scholars throughout the centuries. Hidden truth comes to light in time. In this video, we are going to fully reveal and discuss the secret, hidden and obscured relationship between Francis Bacon and the Jaggard family, the printers and publishers of his essays, and the most famous secular work in the history of the English language, the first folio of the immortal Shakespeare plays. The true relationship between Francis Bacon and the Jaggards has remained hidden and obscured despite the fact, which remains virtually unknown to the wider world, that in the two decades leading up to the printing and publishing of the Shakespeare First Folio, the brothers William and John Jaggard, who were well known to Bacon, printed and published several editions of his essays, including an edition shortly after the publication of the First Folio. During the time the folio was moving through the Jaggard's printing shop, Ben Johnson, who contributed two important poems to it, was living with Francis Bacon at Gorhambury, assisting him in the translation of his essays into Latin. Friend, confidant and fellow brother, Johnson knew Bacon was Shakespeare. What follows is an overview of some of the themes that are explored in the video. The Jaggards were a printing family forever immortalised by their connection to the first folio. The art of printing and publishing was a relatively new and costly medium and would have been undertaken by highly skilled men and women that moved in well-connected and influential circles. William and John Jaggard were brothers. John was married to Elizabeth and William's son was Isaac. In 1584, Bacon knew the Jaggards from around this period, if not before, as they were near contemporaries. John Jaggard was apprenticed to influential printer and publisher Richard Tottle, and his son William Tottle both lived and worked with Francis Bacon. The Tottles were associated with a well-connected group of prominent and influential lawyers and law printers, and as a result of these connections, held an important law patent and monopoly to sell law books. Their shop was near Gray's Inn, at the same time its rising star Francis Bacon was assembling its library. Tottle had in his possession a huge collection of Bacon's manuscripts. In 1606, we see Francis Bacon's essays printed for John Jaggard. Later in 1613, Francis Bacon's essays were printed by William Jaggard for John Jaggard. 1680, in 1618, John Jaggard successfully petitions Francis Bacon on behalf of the poor stationers. 1621, at Bacon's 60th birthday celebration, Ben Johnson writes a birthday ode to his friend. Thou stands as if some mystery thou didst. Give me a deep crown bowl that I may sing in raising him the wisdom of my king. 1621, Bacon's letter to Count Gondomar tells of his retirement from the civil stage and his intention to betake myself to letters and to the instruction of the actors themselves and the service of posterity. Bacon begins preparing the first folio for the presses with help from his friend Ben Johnson. In 1623, between 500 and 1,000 editions of the Shakespeare first folio are printed and, as we shall see, it contains concealed proof that Bacon was Shakespeare. 1623, in the first folio of dedication, Ben Johnson says of the author, Leave thee alone for the comparison of all that insolent Greece or haughty Rome sent forth or, or since did from their ashes come. In 1624, Francis Bacon's essays are printed for Elizabeth Jaggard. In 1641, in Ben Johnson's posthumously published Meditations, he writes of his friend Bacon, repeating the wording he used for him in the folio dedication in 1623. He who hath filled up all numbers, and performed that in our tongue, which may be compared or preferred either to insolent Greece or haughty Rome. In the closed and secretive world of 16th and early 17th century printing and publishing, virtually nothing is known about the private and personal lives of the early printers and publishers. 
For several centuries, information about William Jaggard and other members of the Jaggard family proved to be out of reach for even the most diligent student and equally presented real challenges for scholars and researchers wishing to know the most basic biographical facts about the man instrumental in the publication of the first folio. In an address at the Stationers Hall, London, Captain William Jaggard, a descendant of the Elizabethan printers and publishers William and John Jaggard, succinctly summed up the curious and systematic silence surrounding his ancestor. In all Great Britain, we have not yet recognised that he ever existed. True, there is an expensive monument at St Mary's, Aldermanbury, to Heming and Condell, but not a word about this stationer who made them famous. The Dictionary of National Biography and every other everyday dictionary and encyclopedia is equally eloquent in its silent ignorance of this pioneer founder of our proud body of our English literature. Something similar is observed in The Standard, a printer of Shakespeare, The Book and Times of William Jaggard by Edwin Elliot Willoughby, issued nearly 90 years ago. In the opening statement in the preface to the only full-length work on William Jaggard, which gathered up the few biographical facts available about him and other members of the Jaggard family, he says... One of the ironies of Shakespearean study is the fact that, although the lives of most of the important critics who have amended or explained the words which the journeymen of William Jaggard put into type have been fully treated, no life of this printer of Shakespeare has ever been written. No account of him is given in that great role of prominent Englishman, the Dictionary of National Biography, nor in the great reference work, the Encyclopaedia Britannica, although both of these works contain a biography of his fellow stationer, Edward Blount, who evidently entered into the venture of the publication of the first folio of Shakespeare after Jaggard had made all the arrangements and had printed at least one third of the volume. Willoughby described the lack of a life or serious study of Jaggard as one of the ironies of Shakespearean studies. Irony is not the right word. The lack of a life or study and the absence to the present day of even the most basic biographical facts and the virtually non-existent information about his private and professional relationships and personal circumstances circle of friends, along with the want of letters and private papers, is not some casualty of time, or one of those so-called coincidences so beloved of Stratfordian scholars. The true reason for this intentional obscurity, and one still practised by high authority to the present day, will soon become only all too apparent. The ordinary reader, in wishing to obtain an overview of the life of William Jaggard, is naturally unlikely to seek out 90-year-old, relatively inaccessible texts. Rather, they are more likely, with complete confidence, to seek out the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, published under the trusted auspices of Oxford University Press. They will also doubtless be further reassured to find that the entry for William Jaggard is written by Professor Stanley Wells a director of the Shakespeare Institute of the University of Birmingham, vice chairman of the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, honorary president of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and joint editor of the Oxford Works of Shakespeare. The brief entry amounting to a single page cites as its principal source the aforementioned Willoughby's still standard, a printer of Shakespeare, the books and times of William Jaggard. For reasons best known to himself, Sir Stanley Wells finds no room to mention Bacon, and consequently the not insignificant fact that William and his brother John Jaggard were responsible for printing and publishing several edition, editions of Bacon's essays, whose name, moreover, perfectly understood by Sir Stanley Wells, will be forever attached to the authorship of the Shakespeare works. The secrecy surrounding Bacon and his relationship with William Jaggard and other members of the Jaggard family has also been systematically suppressed by his editors and biographers, beginning with his first editor and biographer, Dr William Rawley. 
He remained absolutely silent about Bacon's relationship with the Jaguards, with whom Bacon was having dealing with, dealings with at the time Dr. Rawley was living with his Rosicrucian grandmaster, and assisting him, together with Ben Jonson, in organising and preparing the Shakespeare First Folio for its passage through the Jaguards' printing presses. This silence continued down the 17th and 18th centuries through to the seven-volume, 3,000-page standard, Letters and Life of Francis Bacon, by James Spedding. And nor does the name of William and John Jaggard appear in the index of its accompanying seven volumes of the works of Francis Bacon. Just prior to the dawn of a new millennium, a new biography entitled The Troubled Life of Francis Bacon by Professors Lisa Jardine and Alan Stewart, which immediately established itself as the most important and exhaustive account of its illustrious subjects in Spedding, was published to wide critical acclaim in 1998. The 637-page work, the most exhaustive single-volume orthodox account of the life of Bacon ever written, also examines and discusses more than 40 of Bacon's works and writings, including his essays, but it does not once refer to William and John Jaggard. The same is true of the most recent full-length biography, Francis Bacon, The Double-Edged Life of the Philosopher and Statesman, by Professor Robert P. Ellis, published in America in 2015, wherein he extensively discusses Bacon's essays, but he too makes no mention of William and John Jaggard, the printers and publishers of Bacon's essays, with the latter printer of the first folio of the Shakespeare works. What secret and hidden information have his editors and biographers been concealing from the world for the last 400 years, and why? The printers and publishers William and John Jaggard were sons of John Jaggard, a London barber surgeon, and his wife Bridget. The place and precise date of their birth remains unknown, and nothing is known of their early upbringing and education. It is believed that John Jaggard the Elder of the two brothers was born around 1567 and William around a year later in 1568. They spent their young years growing up in the parish of St Botolph without Aldersgate, just beyond the city walls, situated a couple of miles from where Bacon grew up at York House on the Strand. Their intertwined destinies would decades later result in the setting forth of the Shakespeare First Folio, the greatest literary work in the English language. On the 20th of August 1584, William Jaggard was apprenticed for eight years to the distinguished printer Henry Denham, a former apprentice of the printer and publisher Richard Tottle, who was known to Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon and whose son William Tottle had a long and close relationship with Francis Bacon and served under him as one of his six clerks of the Chancery. His brother, John Jaggard, was apprenticed to Richard Tottle on the 19th of October 1584 for a term of about seven years. It was most likely the late 1580s which marked the first contact or beginnings of the embryonic secret and hidden relationship between Bacon and the Jaggards, when they were still serving their apprenticeships with Henry Denham and Richard Tottle both of whom Bacon, during the period of the 1580s and 1590s, was privately and professionally in regular contact. The prominent and wealthy printer and publisher Richard Tottle was admitted to the Stationers Company in January 1552. From the outset of his career in London, Tottle was associated with a well-connected group of important and influential lawyers and law printers, and as a result of these connections, on the 12th of April 1553, he was granted the exclusive right to print for seven years all almoner books of as temporal law called the Common Law, a valuable patent and monopoly for printing law books he exploited to the full. When Elizabeth came to the throne in November 1558, she immediately knighted and appointed Sir William Cecil as her principal Secretary of State, 
and soon after in the December his brother-in-law, Sir Nicholas Bacon, to the highest legal office in the kingdom as Lord Keeper and de facto Lord Chancellor of England. A few weeks after their appointments on the 12th of January 1559, Tottle's law patent was renewed, this time with the support of Cecil and Bacon for the rest of his life. It was around this time that Richard Tottle married Joan, the daughter of Richard Grafton, who had been the King's printer during the reign of Edward VI. Their union produced a son named William, born in 1560, who would later study the law and become one of the six clerks in Chancery under Lord Chancellor Francis Bacon, who was himself born a few months later on the 22nd of January 1561. In the following year, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon entered his two sons, Nicholas and Nathaniel Bacon, at Gray's Inn in December 1562, and in 1565 his other son, Edward Bacon, all three of whom doubtless patronised Richard Tottle's shop for their law books and other legal treaties. Richard's son, William Tottle, entered Middle Temple in 1576, together with Richard Grafton the Younger, with the Lord Keeper entering his son, Francis Bacon, on the 20th of June 1576 at Gray's Inn. It was most likely from this time, and certainly after Bacon returned from France following the death of Sir Nicholas Bacon, and was admitted to Gray's Inn in Trinity term 1579, that the personal and professional relationship between Francis Bacon and William Tottle flourished in their many years spent at the Inns of Court. The prominence and importance of Richard Tottle in the Stationers' Company was confirmed in his election as Master in 1578, a position to which he was re-elected in 1584. It was in this year that John Jaggard began his seven-year apprenticeship under Tottle, with his brother William Jaggard commencing his apprenticeship around the same time under John Denham. With his monopoly on law books and premises at the sign of the Hand and Star close to the Inns of Court, Richard Tottle serviced the needs of the young lawyers with the books required for their legal training, among them the resident and rising star of Gray's Inn, Francis Bacon, whom during the seven years the Jaggards served their apprenticeships would on countless occasions have visited the premises of Richard Tottle for books and other legal stationery. In 1943, Alan Keane announced in his prospectus the private manuscript library of Francis Bacon, Lord Verulam, and of his law clerk and servant William Tottle being the astonishing history of 47 commonplace and other written books preserved in an old country house originally owned by Tottle. Keane had discovered a collection of 17th century manuscript commonplace books which contained manuscript and printed copies of Bacon's speeches, letters and works. They had been found along with other miscellaneous manuscripts and printed items at Shardlow's near Amersham, an estate acquired by William Tottle in 1595, later inherited by his grandson William Drake. Keane claimed the books were compiled for Bacon during the later part of his life by his servant William Tottle and formed part of the private library of Bacon and that Bacon made good use of them, reading them attentively, often placing his mark of a trefoil in the margin. The earliest dated volume from the collection at Shardlow's is inscribed Liber Wilmi Tottil Anno Domini 1590 bearing Tottle's autograph signature on the flyleaf. It consists of a yearbook of legal notes compiled by Tottle in 1590 on cases from the reign of Richard II and, according to Keane, the hand of Bacon appears in the volume. In Manuscript Book 5 of the collection from the Library at Shardlow's, which contains a treatise, Reasons for Precedence of Doctors Before Sergeants at Law, and extracts from Latin authors, extensively marked with the Bacon monogram. On its cover, seen under ultraviolet light or by the application of a regent, is Honorificab, a truncated version of the long word in love la Love's Labour's Lost. 
A version of the long word is also scribbled on the cover of Bacon's collection of manuscripts, otherwise known as the Northumberland Manuscript, which originally held his Shakespeare plays Richard II and Richard III. A manuscript volume originally housed at the old library at Shardlow's, purchased by Keane in 1935, is also of a good deal of interest. Keane believed it originally belonged to the Elizabethan publisher John Harrison the Elder. It was John Harrison who put forth Shakespeare's first heir of mine invention, Venus and Adonis. The first leaf of this little book of mine has John Harrison's signature, John Harrison, and beneath it a note, Mr Blunt dwells in Paul's churchyard at the sign of the Black Bears, a reference to the famous publisher Edward Blount and Man of Letters, who, in company with Jaggard, issued the first folio of Shakespeare's comedies, histories and tragedies in 1623. On the same leaf, whose was scribbled a hasty memorandum in reference to a certain my lord, who was apparently in great fear of his life. Had I then known the significance of entries within the volume from Shardlow's, the identification of my lord with Francis Bacon would have been proved. The owner of these manuscripts, William Tottle, variously described as Bacon's law clerk, one of his six clerks in Chancery, his servant and private secretary, and steward of Bacon's manors and estates, was on a number of occasions called upon to borrow his master money. The two of them had been lifelong and intimate friends, and Tottle had served his Rosicrucian master Bacon for many years leading up to his death, through the time when the Shakespeare First Folio, dedicated to Grand Master of England William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, was being guided by Bacon and those acting on his behalf through the printing presses of William Jaggard. Brother John Jaggard had been apprenticed for seven years to his father, Richard Tottle. William Tottle, who served Bacon for years or even decades, as well as William and John Jaggard, moved in Rosicrucian Freemasonic circles and were likely members of the secret brotherhood directed by Bacon, who they knew to be the secret poet and dramatist Shakespeare. The legal formalities surrounding the debt of £500 owed by Bacon's estate to, to William Tottle was overseen by Tottle's executors, his grandson William Drake and his father-in-law Sir John Denham. Judge Sir John Denham, appointed Baron of the Exchequer in 1617, was the father of the poet and dramatist Sir John Denham. The younger Denham led an extraordinary life. A secret royal agent entrusted with nine of Charles I's ciphers, Denham, Denham appears in royalist documents under several different pseudonyms. A spy in the employ of John Thurlow, head of the English Secret Service, under Cromwell, referred to Denham as the state's poet. Denham was a close friend of Philip Herbert, 5th Earl of Pembroke, with whom he often stayed at Wilton. His father was Philip Herbert, 4th Earl of Pembroke, whom together with his brother William, 3rd Earl of Pembroke, then Grand Master of England, were the incomparable pair of brethren to whom Bacon dedicated the 1623 first folio of the Shakespeare works, printed by William and Isaac Jaggard. William, Earl of Pembroke, was chosen Grand Master in 1618, and being approved by the King, he appointed Inigo Jones his deputy Grand Master. Grand Master Pembroke demitted AD 1630. The incomparable pair, pair of brethren, William and Philip Herbert, to whom Bacon dedicated the 1623 first folio of the Shakespeare works, were kinsmen to George Herbert, poet and friend of Francis Bacon, who assisted him in the translation of his Advancement of Learning into Latin, which was published within days of the first folio in 1623. Later, Bacon dedicated his 1624 Psalms to George Herbert. To the sleepy temporal world, Bacon supposedly died on the 9th of April 1626 at Highgate, the London residence of his close friend the Earl of Arundel, to whom he addressed his last letter. In 1632, Arundel was appointed Grand Master of England.
Thomas Howard, Earl of Arundel, then succeeded the Earl of Danby at the head of the fraternity, with Inigo Jones appointed Deputy Grandmaster. Following the appointment of Francis Russell, Earl of Bedford, as the Grand Master of England, Rosie Crucian Inigo Jones was again appointed Grand Master of England. Bacon's lifelong friend and Rosicrucian brother, Inigo Jones, died in 1652, and following the restoration, he was succeeded as Grand Master of England in 1660 by Bacon's kinsman, Henry Jermyn, Earl of St Albans, who appointed Sir John Denham his Deputy Grand Master, who was also soon after elected one of the first fellows of the Baconian Rosicrucian Royal Society. The Lodges approved their choice of Henry Jermyn, Earl of St Albans, as their Grand Master, who appointed Sir John Denham his Deputy Grand Master. This Grand Master held a General Assembly and feast on St John's Day, 27th of December 1663. In his brilliant full-length biography, Henry Germain, Stuart Spymaster and architect of the British Empire, about who very little was previously known, its author, Anthony Adolf, who suggests Bacon might have been his early mentor, states that Germain chose his title partly in memory of his kinsman and hero, Bacon, who he worshipped until his dying day. Before he left Colombe, Charles had signified his renewed confidence in Germain by granting him an earldom. German chose the title of the Earl of St Albans. German chose this partly in memory of his kinsman Francis Bacon, who had been Viscount St Albans. As William and John Jaggard were about to embark on their careers as printers and publishers of Bacon's essays, culminating in William Jaggard printing the Shakespeare First Folio, described by some as the greatest Freemasonic book in the world, these were the secret and hidden Rosicrucian Freemasonic circles they found themselves immersed in, at whose head stood its Grand Master, Francis Bacon Shakespeare. Following his seven-year apprenticeship under his master Richard Tottle, on the 7th of August 1591, John Jaggard was formally sworn and admitted a freeman of the Stationers Company, and a few months later, at the end of his apprenticeship under Henry Denham, his younger brother William Jaggard was made a freeman of the Worshipful Company of Stationers on the 6th of December 1591. At some time between December 1591 and April 1593, William Jaggard set up his first shop located at the east end of the churchyard of St Dunstan's in the west, Fleet Street. Nearby was Richard Tottle's place of business at the sign of the Hand and Star, where his brother John Jaggard was employed, located on the north side of Fleet Street within Temple Bar, conveniently close for the Inns of Court and Law Courts. During the lifelong generational relationship between Bacon and Richard and William Tottle, an equally obscured parallel private and professional association between Bacon and Richard Tottle's apprentice John Jaggard and his brother William also developed. On the death of Richard Tottle, sometime in the summer or autumn of 1593, his common law patent officially passed to Charles Yetzwirt on 24th of March 1594 for the printing of law books. He entered into some agreement with the heirs of Tottle and with John Jaggard and Yetzwert giving the Hand and Star as their business address. What actually happened, we may be quite certain, was that Yetzwert, who had no printing experience and was still engrossed no doubt in his official and professional duties, entrusted John Jaggard with the conduct of the shop while he managed in a general way the outside business. In Shakespeare and the Tudor Jaggards, Captain William Jaggard observes that in John Jaggard's shop, we may be sure Sir Francis Bacon was a regular buyer, which, as it was during the period Bacon was creating and building up the law library at Gray's Inn, and that he was himself a devourer of law books, it is probably no exaggeration to say he virtually lived in the place.
On the 25th of April 1595, Charles Yetzwert died. However, the business continued in the name of his widow, Jane Yetzwert, run on a day-to-day -day basis by John Jaggard, one regularly patronised by Bacon. Two years later, on the 5th of June 1597, at the Church of St Dunstan's in the West, John Jaggard married Elizabeth Mabb, who afterwards, as we shall see, printed an, printed an edition of Bacon's Essays. And in the same year, William Jaggard took on an apprentice, Thomas Coates, who afterwards printed for Bacon his Certain Considerations Touching the Better Pacification and Edification of the Church of England, and after succeeding to the Jaggard family business, printed the second folio of the Shakespeare works. In the mid-1590s, a number of Bacon's essays were already circulating in manuscript that required his intervention at the Stationers' Company to forestall an unauthorised edition. At first glance, the choice of the relatively obscure publisher Humphrey Hooper to publish the first edition of Bacon's essays might appear a strange one. Perhaps it might have had something to do with Humphrey Hooper being apprenticed to Richard Tottle, to whom John Jaggard was also apprenticed. Bacon dedicated the first edition of his essays to his beloved brother, Anthony Bacon. The following day, its dedicatee, Anthony Bacon, presented Francis's royal brother, Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex, with a copy of his brother's essays, wherein, in encoded words, Anthony says to Essex that in reality, that they were dedicated to both of us. In 1604, William Jaggard began sharing an office with James Roberts, and from 1604 to 1606, books bearing the imprint of Jaggard and Roberts were issued from the press. A few years earlier, his fellow printer Roberts printed an, an edition of Titus Andronicus and The Merchant of Venice, which partly reflects the experience of Bacon being arrested in September 1598 for the non-payment of a £300 bond owed to a moneylender named Simpson, who attempted to have Bacon thrown in the fleet. In the play, the personal circumstances of Bacon is reflected in Bassanio and his legal persona in Dr. Bellario, with his brother, Anthony Bacon, who continually paid off his debts, the model for its titular character, Antonio, a merchant of Venice. Queen Elizabeth died in 1603, and a year or so later, Roberts printed the revised and greatly enlarged second quarto edition of Hamlet in 1604 to 5. The Tudor tragedy Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, shadows some of the most explosive secrets of the Elizabethan reign, in which the not so virgin Queen Elizabeth, Queen Gertrude, was secretly married to Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, King Claudius, with whom she had a concealed royal son, Francis Bacon Tudor, Prince of Wales, Prince Hamlet. It is a play about a disinherited royal prince and the exhaustion of the Tudor dynasty. On the first page of the text appears a woodcut bearing the Tudor arms in the middle of it, below which are the opening lines of the text between Francisco and Barnardo, one of which possesses the Christian name of Bacon, the two of them the initials of Francis Bacon, with the full names of Francisco and Barnardo also containing an anagram of its author, Francis Bacon. During the period William Jaggard and James Roberts were sharing an office from 1604 to 1606, books bearing the imprint of Jaggard and Roberts were issued from the press, which prompted Willoughby to observe that William Jaggard should have been able to attain the amb ambition of every stationer in London to conduct a printing press of his own is somewhat surprising. Despite the indications of Jaggard's increasing prosperity, we could hardly have expected him to be in a position to pay in cash the value of the printing house in Barbican. For Willoughby, the explanation came with the lucrative Royal Commission to print the commandments for use in churches and chapels throughout England and Ireland. On the 26th of May 1604, King James issued a royal warrant to all the archbishops and bishops of the realms of England and Ireland, instructing them 
to give order that in every church and chapel a table of the Ten Commandments may be set up by William Jaggard, his deputies or assigns at the charge of the parish. Willoughby was of the opinion that it is useless to speculate how Jaggard became the recipient of such royal favour, but we respectfully are inclined to disagree with him. In this year, Bacon was in very high standing with the King. Only months previously, he had composed an important political work close to the heart of the freshly crowned monarch, entitled A Brief Discourse Touching the Happy Union of the Kingdoms of England and Scotland, dedicated in private to His Majesty. He followed this up in 1604 with Certain Articles or, or Considerations Touching the Union of the Kingdoms of England and Scotland, Collected and Dispersed for His Majesty's Better Service, and Certain Considerations Touching the Better Pacification and Edification of the Church of England, Dedicated to His Most Excellent Majesty. On the 18th of August 1604, a grateful James I appointed Bacon his King's Council, and Bacon may well have been instrumental in re requesting that the King grant the very lucrative Royal Commission to William Jaggard, allowing him to purchase the very expensive printing house at the Barbican. Around the same time, or not too long after, the copyright of Bacon's essays passed to William's brother John Jaggard. It is not known in what circumstances and precisely at what date this happened, but as Bacon had been in close and regular contact one way or another with William and John Jaggard for many years, if not decades, the arrangement for the transfer of copyright from Hooper to Jaggard was probably conducted behind closed doors at Bacon's private residence. It is not impossible that John Jaggard held the right of publishing Bacon's essays from their author. His shop was quite close to Bacon's house. His old master's son was a steward of Bacon, and in 1618, as we shall see, Bacon interested himself in a petition which John Jaggard presented, partly on the behalf of the poor stationers of London and partly on behalf of himself. The extremely rare 1606 Jaggard edition of Bacon's Essays is a pageantry reprint of the 1598 Hooper edition, published without the name of any printer on its title page. In keeping with the 1604-5 edition of the Tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, printed by Roberts, who was sharing the same premises with William Jaggard, above whose page appears a woodcut bearing the Tudor arms in its centre, Similarly, on the title page of the 1606 Jaggard edition of Bacon's Essays is printed a woodcut with two cupids with Tudor arms in its centre. Six years later, in 1612, John Jaggard published his second edition of Bacon's Essays, again printed with a woodcut with two cupids with the Tudor arms in its centre on its title page, from his business address in Fleet Street within walking distance from Bacon's quarters at Gray's Inn. At this juncture, the rights to Bacon's essays took on a legal complication, which was to have implications for the next 30 years. In the summer of 1612, Bacon prepared a new 241-page edition of his essays, in which nine of the original ten printed by Hooper and Jaggard were revised and enlarged with 29 new essays added. The edition was entered into the Stationer's Register as a new work and without any transfer on the 12th of October 1612 to William Hall and John Beale, with an edition with the title The Essays of Sir Francis Bacon Knight, the King's Solicitor General, printed by John Beale soon after and before the end of the year. In an immediate response to the Beale edition, John Jaggard published a second 1612 edition of Bacon's Essays, with the same wordy title page as his first edition, with its woodcut bearing two cupids with Tudor arms in its centre. 
The second edition is made up of the sheets of his first 1612 edition, together with a resetting of the new essays of the Beale edition presented as the second part of essays. The second Jaggard issue adds everything from the Beale edition, however it does not have the revised form of the original ten essays. It seems Jaggard had acted on his prior rights to the ten essays obtained from both Hooper and Bacon, and with no record of any transfer of copyright, he further appropriated the new Beale essays into the second part of his 1612 edition. Three editions of the essays, all according to their title pages printed for John Jaggard, appeared in 1613. The three editions are readily distinguished by the different spelling of the word attorney on their respective title pages. The first and undisputed of these editions was printed by William Jaggard. On the top of the dedication page appears a woodcut, with at its centre a Tudor rose above which sits a crown, an allusion to Bacon's concealed birth as a Tudor prince and rightful heir to the crown of England. Evidence produced by Professor Kiernan, editor of the recent Oxford Clarendon Press edition of Bacon's Essays, shows that the second and third editions were surreptitiously printed by Beale and made to appear like the John Jaggard edition. With the first of the falsely dated Beale editions actually printed around 1615 to 1618 and the second perhaps a year or two later. What is curious is this could hardly have escaped the notice of John Jaggard, yet no complaint, legal or otherwise, is known to be made by him. And whatever the circumstances, it is not impossible that there was some kind of private arrangement between the two of them, for reasons best known to themselves and now lost to history, which might otherwise account for the falsely dated second and third editions. During this period, John Jaggard was in regular contact with Bacon, who no doubt took a close interest in the nature of the printing of his own essays, and most likely Bacon and Jaggard had a number of private conversations about them at either Jaggard's place of business or Bacon's official residence at York House. In 1618, Jaggard also successfully petitioned Lord Chancellor Bacon and Chief Justice Sir Henry Montague regarding a dispute on behalf of the poor stationers of London. In 1618, evidently, he, John Jaggard, assumed the leadership of the poorer stationers against the master, wardens and assistants of the company, whom he accused of giving, giving privileges to the English stock part of the group of copyrights, which had reverted to the company, to strangers and men of other companies, instead of to, to the poor of their own company, to whom it belonged. John Jaggard petitioned the Chief Justice Sir Henry Montague and the Lord Chancellor Francis Bacon, asking for their intervention in this matter. John Jaggard's petition was successful. On the 10th of May 1618, both Montague and Bacon endorsed the petition, ordering the officials of the company to obey their own regulations, and five days later, Bacon wrote from York House to reinforce his endorsement. In 1618, Bacon was created Baron Verulam, and emulating his father, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, he was appointed Chancellor of England and now stood at the very pinnacle of his public career as the highest legal officer in the kingdom. Incidentally, given contemporary attitudes to drama and poetry, highly significant reasons why he did not put his own name to his Shakespeare plays and poems. In October 1620, he published part of his Instauratio Magna and was very busy making plans with his good friend Ben Johnson for a milestone birthday that was now beckoning on the horizon. His generous largesse and grand entertainments, festivities and birthday celebrations were legendary and all the London elite would have been in a state of great expectation and excitement awaiting an invitation to what promised to be the party of the decade. When the day of Bacon's 60th birthday on the 22nd of January 1621 arrived, it was celebrated with a lavish banquet at his official residence, York House on the Strand. A large throng of the great and the good began beating a path to his door. 
His guests included members of the royal family, the nobility from the city and, and the country, with the dukes and earls in all their finery, and the courtiers and the gentlemen of the court. It was also very likely that his guest list included many members of his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood, among them past and future Grand Masters of England, Inigo Jones, the Earl of Arundel, and the then current Grand Master of England, William Herbert, 1st Earl of Pembroke, to whom Bacon, two years later, dedicated his Shakespeare First Folio. To celebrate his birthday, York House was doubtless dutifully attended by High Court judges and Chief Justices of the realm, as well as other senior law figures, including his own clerk in Chancery, William Tottle, the steward of Bacon's estates and son of his old friend, printer and publisher, Richard Tottle, under whom John Jagard served an apprenticeship. For a great writer like Bacon, the printers and publishers of the Worshipful Stationers' Company would doubtless have attended his grand birthday celebrations, many of whom he had enjoyed long relationships going back years and even decades. Most likely among them were William and John Jaggard, the printers and publishers of Bacon's essays, Isaac Jaggard, printer with his father William of the Shakespeare First Folio, and other members of the First Folio Syndicate, John Smethick, William Aspley and Edward Blount. Then there were the poets and the playwrights, George Herbert, Thomas Randolph, and of course the poet and playwright Ben Jonson, who for his 60th birthday celebrations wrote the following ode entitled Lord Bacon's Birthday, in which he describes Bacon as his king and about whom he says there is some kind of mystery surrounding him. Hail, happy genius of this ancient pile, how comes it all things so about thee smile? The fire, the wine, the men, and in the midst thou stands as if some mystery thou didst. Give me a deep crowned bowl that I may sing in raising him the wisdom of my king. Following his politically motivated fall from grace on the 6th of June 1621, Bacon wrote an astonishing letter to his inward and trusted friend, the Spanish ambassador, Count Gondomar. In his letter, Bacon explicitly states he now planned to devote himself to the instruction of the actors in reference to his plans for the Shakespeare First Folio and to the service of posterity. Interestingly, Gondomar owned a Shakespeare First Folio with annotations, which has since mysteriously disappeared. Your Excellency's love towards me I have found ever warm and sincere, alike in prosperity and adversity, for which I give you due thanks. But for myself, my age, my fortune, yea, my genius, to which I have hitherto done but scant justice, calls me now to retire from the stage of civil action and betake myself to letters and to the instruction of the actors themselves and the service of posterity. In the last five years of his recorded life, Bacon wrote, revised, expanded, translated and published an enormous body of his writings and works in Latin and English. This was carried out in his literary workshop at Gorhambury with the help of his good pens, including the poet and dramatist Ben Jonson, who assisted Bacon in translating his essays, previously printed and published by William and John Jaggard, into Latin. The Latin translation of them were a work performed by diverse hands, by those of Dr Hackett, late Bishop of Lichfield, Mr Benjamin Johnson, the learned and judicious poet, and some others whose names I once heard from Dr Rawley, but I cannot now recall them. With Ben Johnson now living with Bacon at Gorhambury, Bacon was busy gathering together from various manuscripts and printed sources all his Shakespeare plays for publication in what is known as the first folio of the Shakespeare works. Twenty plays had been previously published in quarto editions and another sixteen were to be published for the first time in the first folio. Many of the 20 plays previously issued in quarto editions were variously revised, amended and expanded by Bacon, with Ben Jonson working alongside him, busily preparing and writing some of the prefatory matter, 
prefixed to the first folio. The preliminary pages of the Shakespeare first folio consist of a verse signed by Ben Jonson facing the Drowshack portrait. The same poet and dramatist living with Bacon at Gorhambury and a member of his Rosicrucian Brotherhood also provides another long commendatory poem to the memory of my beloved the author, Mr William Shakespeare, whom Ben Jonson has known for many years to be nothing more than a pseudonym or literary mask for his Rosicrucian Grandmaster, Lord Bacon. The learned address to the great variety of readers signed by John Hemming and Henry Condell, both probably semi-literate and who certainly did not possess the learning for it, was itself most likely written by Bacon alone or jointly with Johnson in a folio replete, as we shall see, with other Baconian Rosicrucian secrets. Following the work of Professor Hinman, it is now widely believed that the printing of the first folio commenced in early 1622, and after some delays it took nearly two years to complete. With the printing near its completion on the 8th of November 1623, Edward Blount and Isaac Jaggard entered in the Stationers' Register the copyrights to the plays that had not been previously published, and before the end of the month it was finally set forth into the world. Professor Hinman was also to make a very remarkable discovery, but more of that shortly. The imprint of the first folio claims the volume was printed by Isaac Jaggard and Edward Blount, 1623. But Blount was only a publisher and the printing of the folio was done entirely in the printing shop of William Jaggard and his son Isaac. On the last page of the Shakespeare first folio appears a second colophon, printed at the charges of W. Jaggard, Ed Blount, I. Smethwick and W. Aspley, 1623. Sometime before his greatest triumph saw the light of day, William Jaggard died in late October or early November. His will, made on the 28th of March 1623, proved on the 17th of November 1623, named his wife Jane Jaggard as, as executor of his substantial estate. On the 4th of November 1623, his son Isaac succeeded him as the printer of the City of London, and while Jane Jaggard took nominal charge of the press, Isaac continued to manage the actual printing and day-to-day -day running of the business. With all the prefatory matter prefixed to the first folio carefully arranged by Bacon, he very deliberately placed at the front of the work the mysterious Shakespeare play, The Tempest. For various reasons, virtually all Shakespeare and Baconian scholars know the play occupies a very special place in the Shakespeare canon. It has been described by Shakespeare and Baconian scholars as the most Baconian of all the plays, and that its central godlike figure, the scientific philosopher Prospero, is a portrait made in the image of his creator, the scientific philosopher Francis Bacon, the founding father of modern science and the modern world. Through his all-knowing and all-seeing mind, the scientific philosopher Prospero controls the world and future destiny of mankind and can be seen as the philosophic commander-in-chief of the Rosicrucian brothers who govern so Solomon's house in Bacon's New Atlantis, land of the Rosicrucians, with Solomon's house or Solomon's temple adopted as the founding legend of its outer body of the Freemasonry Brotherhood. Like the play itself, the very first page of the play in the Shakespeare first folio is also very special, and the first letter of the first word of the text proper conceals and reveals the identity of its secret hidden author, Francis Bacon. In the second half of the 20th century, the American scholar Professor Charlton Hinman subjected the printing of the first folio to a forensic technical study in The Printing and Proofreading of the First Folio of Shakespeare, based on an investigation of some 80 copies in the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington. 
Like most large standard works, it largely remains unread from cover to cover, and some of its contents remain effectively hidden and unknown to the world, not helped by the fact that in its index, one name is very conspicuous by its absence, namely Francis Bacon. Tucked away in volume 1, page 251, he does however mention Baconians when referring to some very unusual early prints of the folio. As explained by Professor Hinman. Original upside down setting of the large ornamental initial B, which begins the text proper, was almost immediately noticed and corrected, for it is to be seen in but one copy, Folger 24. The incorrect signature was only later put right, since the page is missigned B in four copies in addition to Folger 24 and the press was thereafter stopped once again to replace the defective S of Actus Primus Sena Prima, for the broken letter is still to be seen in two copies, Folger 12 and 78, which are otherwise fully corrected. Thus we have State 1, uncorrected, as in Folger 24. State 2, ornamental, ornamental initial, righted, but both signature and senna still uncorrected, as in Folger 1, 14, 28 and 44. State 3, signature correct, but senna still defective, as in Folger 12 and 78. And State 4, fully corrected, as in most copies, the press having been stopped a third time simply in order to replace the defective FS of senna. This last alteration is somewhat surprising because it is so trifling, but it is doubtless reflects the special care for appearances thought necessary in the first page of the first play in the volume. Baconians, however, will perhaps find other meanings both in the broken S and in the two Bs that invite such particular attention in the early state of page A1. In this very carefully worded method of delivery, one Bacon himself would have been proud of, Professor Hinman does not say anything else and it is not immediately clear just exactly what he actually means by his comments. And his very learned academic readers, if they ever actually read it, might not have been any of the wiser concerning just what he was hinting at. We should carefully take in the full comprehension of his final sentence on the matter. Baconians, however, will perhaps find other meanings both in the broken S and in the two Bs that invite such particular attention in the early state of page A1. I think he knew of what he obscurely alludes to, and yes, there are most certainly other meanings. Interestingly, there are 33 unbracketed words in the paragraph pertaining to Baconians. They are underlined in green. And as all Baconians know, Bacon is 33 in simple cipher. Let us first take into account the unique one-off upside-down setting of the large ornamental B and what it signifies. The barrister and Member of Parliament Sir Edwin Durning Lawrence, a voluminous advocate of Bacon's authorship of the Shakespeare poems and plays, was familiar with the Baconian device of printed upside down headpieces, engravings and ornaments and what it arcanely indicated to the initiated. This trick of the upside down printing of ornaments and even of engravings is continually resorted to when some revelation concerning Bacon's works is given and more specifically, we may be perfectly certain that we shall find some revelation concerning Bacon and Shakespeare. What is it then concerning the two Bs that Professor Hinman chose not to spell out for us? Firstly, let us take a look at the signature B at the bottom of the page. The correct signature should be A, and the signature B is only found in four other copies. The letter B is obviously the first letter of the surname Bacon, and if we look across the line in the adjacent column, it reads, a cry within, which means something that is not uttered out loud. These first two words begin with an A and C. Thus, we have the letters B, A, C, a self-evident contraction of Bacon. Nor do we have to look too far for the missing O and N. 
The last part of the sentence reads, Enter Sebastian, Antonio and Gonzalo. The O and N is found twice in the name Antonio, the Christian name of Bacon's brother, Anthony Bacon. And it will be observed that the line, omitting the ampersand, contains 39 letters, F. Bacon in simple cipher. Let us now turn our attention to the defective S of Actus Primus Sina Prima. What is it Professor Hinman knows about the defective letter S that the schoolmen and virtually the rest of the sleepy Shakespeare world do not? Here, the large upside-down ornamental letter B serves as a clue. If the reader turns this unique page of the Shakespeare first folio upside down, the defective S looks like an F, and the letter CT of Actus, that when read normally looks like a B, reversed, just like the large ornament B, when looked at upside down, also forms the shape of the letter B, giving us the two initial letters of the name Francis Bacon. It should also be noted that the upside down B is followed by the letter A, with its ornate flourish down the one side representing the letter C. Thus, in addition to the initials F and B, we have the letters F, B, A, C, a self-evident contraction of Francis Bacon. The most remarkable feature of all, and present in all the printed first folios, is the large ornamental letter B itself. If the large ornamental B is magnified, as shown in the facsimile, it reveals the name of Francis Bacon hidden in the decorative scrolls, with the name Francis across the top and Francis at the bottom, and the name Bacon down the right side. This decisive evidence completely demolishes the illusion that William Shakespeare was responsible for the Shakespeare works, a fiction first presented to the world nearly 400 years ago with the publication of the first folio printed in the Jaggard printing shop by William and Isaac Jaggard in 1623. As we have seen, the two brothers, William and John Jaggard, were also responsible for printing and publishing a series of Bacon's essays, stretching over two decades, and at the time of the Shakespeare First Folio, John Jaggard still owned the copyright to the essays. John died before the 9th of September 1623, and in only a matter of weeks or perhaps a few months after the publication of the Shakespeare Folio, published in November or December 1623, his recently widowed Elizabeth Jaggard soon published the essays of Sir Francis Bacon in early 1624. The third and final edition of Bacon's Essays contains 58 essays, of which 20 are new, with revised versions of the previously published essays, was entered on the Stationers' Register on the 13th of March 1625 to Richard Whittaker and Hannah Barrett. The edition was published in the April, which prompted the rights controversy brought to the Stationers' Court two months after the publication of the 1625 edition by Elizabeth Jaggard, with the following judgment recorded on the 25th of June 1625. The court had judged Elizabeth Jaggard to have prior rights, apparently deriving from her deceased husband John Jaggard, who had first published a series of Bacon's essays from 1606, one of which was printed for him by his brother William Jaggard, who, with his son Isaac Jaggard, part owned the copyright to the Shakespeare First Folio. Thus, at the time of Bacon's supposed death in April 1626, the Jaggards owned the copyright to his essays and his Shakespeare First Folio. The close, long-standing connections between Francis Bacon and the Jaggards and the hidden clues within the first folio exposes the whole edifice of the Stratfordian illusion that the illiterate or semi-illiterate Shakespeare of Stratford is the author of the immortal Shakespeare poems and plays. This is clearly a Rosicrucian Freemasonic ludibrium to end all ludibriums, played on a theatre of fools for the last 400 years. One, no doubt, that Bacon, who could not pass by a jest, would have approved of. Thank you for listening. More details on the following slide.